This video goes through the development of a 2D rectangular element, one that has four nodes, so it's going to have a bilinear displacement field inside of it, as we'll see. Let's start out with a quick reminder of the things that we need to define in order to be able to say that we have defined a new element. We have to make choices about what the displacement field is that we're interested in and what the stress and the strain field vectors look like. Then we need to define the element geometry and the degree of freedom vector corresponding to the displacement field and the number of nodes. Um, once we have those, we can get the shape function matrix and we go back and remind ourselves about how strain and displacement are related and that gives us the partial derivative matrix operator. We have the stress strain relationship captured in the D matrix and we can then multiply the partial derivative matrix operator by the shape function matrix to give us the B matrix or the strain nodal displacement matrix. That allows us to get to the stiffness matrix and then finally the element force vector. Uh, one of the last things we need to consider is transformation, which will not be covered in this video. All right, let's work through the development of a bilinear rectangular element. You're going to see it is a rectangle. I'll explain bilinear in a couple of slides when we look at the shape functions. So we need to initially define what our displacement field looks like and what our strain and our stress fields look like. And this is the same as what we did for the triangular element in the last video. So now we look at the element geometry. I've got a rectangle defined here, and it's got um, a, a local axis, x prime, y prime axis, and then the nodes, I've chosen the x prime, y prime axis in the middle. This is not the only way I could have defined this element. Obviously, I could have centered it down on the node one here, but this uh, makes it a little bit more clear how I'm balancing things left to right and top to bottom. So this is the more preferred uh, elemental coordinate system to be using for the rectangular element. So you can see that my uh, width of my element is 2b and my height is 2 times h. And I've got the node numbers there. The degrees of freedom, each one of these nodes I'm going to want to allow them to move in both the x and the y direction. So I have two degrees of freedom per node and that gives me my degree of freedom vector which has four terms for each direction, a total of eight terms. So again, here's my element. Remember, I've got now four degrees of freedom in each direction. So if that means in my polynomial, I can have a slightly longer one than the triangle had. I can have four coefficients for each polynomial. So what I'm gonna do is a0 plus a1x plus a2y, the same thing we had for the triangle element, but now I've got another term, and I'm gonna do a3xy. Now, xy is really the first quadratic term, which makes this element higher degree than purely linear, but it is still linear in x and it's linear in y. So that's why we call it a bilinear rectangle. It's linear in both of those, even though we have a first quadratic term. Okay, now I want to resolve these a's in terms of the degrees of freedom d. So I start out with I go through each one of my degrees of freedom in the x direction. Now, everything I'm doing here for the x displacement would be completely analogous for the y displacement, which we call v. So I'm going to be able to use the same shape functions for the two directions. I don't need to go through the development again. So d1x is going to be the displacement in the x direction at node 1, which means evaluating the function u at negative b comma negative h, which gives us the expression shown here d2x is evaluating the displacement field at b comma negative h, which gives us this expression. d3x is evaluating it at b comma h, which gives us this expression. And then d4x is evaluating the displacement field at negative b comma h, and we get this expression. So this is a bit messy. We haven't, because we didn't put the origin down at node one, um, every single one of these expressions has all four of my a's. So to resolve this, it actually makes a lot of sense to use some of the tools we've been developing for matrix manipulations and write this out as a matrix equation. When it's in this form now, you can go through and find the inverse of that matrix and then that allows you to solve for the a terms. You don't have to solve it that way, but it's a straightforward way to do it and it allows you then to determine what each one of those formerly unknown co coefficients were, we're now defining them in terms of the degrees of freedom. So I plug those into my expression for u, 
Remember, I'm not done yet. I've just eliminated the A terms. Now I have my displacement field defined in terms of the Ds, but what I want to do is gather all the terms for each degree of freedom. So I'm going to have something multiplied by D1x plus something multiplied by D2x and so on. That something in each case is going to be the shape function. Here's that expression again, and when I rearrange the terms, I end up with something multiplied by d1x, and that something happens to be 1 over 4bh times b minus x times h minus y. And then you have similar functions in front of d2x, d3x, and d4x. And again, you'll have the same functions if we did this all for the v or y direction. So rewriting this in um, matrix form, that my displacement field vector u is equal to the shape function matrix shown. So it has eight columns and two rows, and it's going to be multiplied by my degree of freedom vector, which has eight terms, where now each one of the shape functions is defined here. You can see that written in this form, all that I'm doing is switching pluses and minuses. So you can kind of think about that pattern here. You can obviously multiply it out if you want to, but this, this is a nice convenient way to look at it. Once I have the shape functions, I can go and get the B matrix. Reminded up at the top there is this is our partial derivative matrix operator. The B matrix is the product of that partial derivative matrix operator acting on the shape function matrix. So the B matrix looks like this. Again, I'm using initial notation. So the comma X or comma Y represents a partial derivative with respect to X or Y. Remember that I do know those shape functions, I just developed them, so when I take these derivatives, I end up with this matrix here for B. Now one thing to note here, unlike the um, linear triangle that we just developed, the three-noted one, because I've got that bilinear term, the B matrix actually depends on X and Y. That means I have a linear variation of strain in the bilinear rectangle element, whereas in the triangle I had a constant strain throughout the whole thing. Also, this introduces a complication because I'm going to have a B matrix transpose times a D matrix times the B matrix. When I do that matrix multiplication, my, K, my integral inside, uh, or the integrand in the K integral, will have quadratic terms in it. So it's going to be a little bit messy to solve that integral. Now I'm not going to find the um, stiffness matrix for this bilinear rectangle element because this element is um, pretty specialty. It, it requires this shape and what we really want is a more um, an element that we can transform into different shapes and so I will discuss what we do in a later video when I look at transformation. But I'm going to jump forward and the other use of the B matrix that we just found is that we can evaluate the strain inside the element. So I'm going to use the B matrix to evaluate the strain at particular locations inside the element. First of all, what we want to do is take the B matrix and evaluate it at a given position. Because remember, strain varies throughout the element. I need to choose where to evaluate this matrix. So I'm going to choose two locations. If we look at the element center, that means we're evaluating it where um, X and Y are both equal to zero and that gives me this matrix. Now, of course, it's a constant because I'm evaluating it at a specific point. I haven't changed the B matrix to a constant matrix. I've just evaluated it somewhere. I'm also going to evaluate it in node 1, which is the lower left corner, and that gives me this matrix. So now, let's use these to find the strain. Okay, so we're going to look at a particular displacement field and see what happens. I'm going to look at pure bending. So when pure bending happens, I've got this rectangle and it's going to get squeezed on one side and stretched on the other. That's how this can represent bending. So it turns into a trapezoid. So for example, if I say that the amount that each corner is squeezed in at the top is equal to the same amount that they're squeezed out at the bottom, that would be the pure bending case. So that gives me actually my displacement field. There are no changes in the y direction, but in the x terms, I've got a minus a for d1x, a plus a for d2x, and so on. So that gives me my degree of freedom vector. This would be after the solution. So I found a k, I've inverted the k, I've solved for this displacement field. So now to post-process, we'll use that d to go to the strain. So back to the B matrix that we evaluated at the element center. If I take this B matrix and I multiply it by the D matrix there, 
I get, I'm sorry, the d vector, the degree of freedom vector, I get the strain. And that multiplication looks like what's shown here, and it ends up with zero strain at the middle. That's what we would expect. There is no strain on the neutral axis for pure beam bending. And that's what's predicted by the theory, and the FE predicts that. That's great. So let's take a look at what happens when we consider node 1. I evaluate B at node 1, and I got this matrix. Now I take this B matrix, multiply it by the D vector above, and evaluate the strain from there. So when I do the matrix multiplication, I get this expression, which simplifies to A over VH times H0B. So I've got a term in the epsilon X location, and I've got a term in the gamma XY location. Epsilon X ends up being equal to A over B, which is what we would expect. That is the bending strain along that bottom edge, and it's positive because we're stretching the bottom edge. But I also picked up a gamma XY term, which is A divided by H. That's unexpected. In pure bending, we don't have shear strain. Shear strain only gets introduced by the shear force, and I don't have one here. This is just pure bending. So as a result, what I've had, what what happens is some of the bending energy gets absorbed in this unexpected shear strain and so we get less deflection of the beam if it's modeled by this element than we would get in reality. This is something that's called shear locking.